Repairing a twin cylinder Stuart 5A steam engine. Part 5. This is a pair of Stuart 5A steam engines coupled together as one unit and they made a knocking noise when running. In this episode I fixed the problem of the worn BN bearing. In the last episode I did mention that I wasn't too keen on doing this job. There isn't much room to work and the two BA nuts are very tight on the bolts. I needed something to hold the bolts at the bottom and I couldn't use a spanner because the angles were all wrong. Nor could I use a socket because even though it fitted the nuts it was too big to fit up against the eccentric strap. Here's the answer. In my Myford lathe chuck I currently have a very cheap and nasty Taiwanese socket. I've had it for many years. Even though this socket is made from a very hard metal it's still turnable using a carbide tip tool. And although you can't currently see it it is underneath the bolts that hold the big end in place. This stops the bolts from rotating whilst I undo the nuts. And here we are. One nut and lock nut removed. Just one more to go. In this clip you can see how difficult it is to get the spanner onto the nut and rotate it. But after a while I managed to do it. When I run this sequence in real time you can see how I had to keep changing sides with the spanner. This was the easiest way to do it. Spannering is not something that I do a lot of. I'm sure any mechanics watching this are finding it amusing because when you use spanners very frequently you automatically know which way round to turn them to put them on the nuts or bolt heads. I rebuilt a 1971 Land Rover in 1999 and while I was doing that I soon found out the best way to position spanners but that's a long time ago. This is not a Land Rover even though it's green. The only thing it's got in common with the Land Rover is the fact that all the nuts and bolts are really far too tight. This clip shows how I held the Taiwanese socket that I reduced the diameter of to prevent the bolts from turning as I slackened the nuts. It was even difficult to remove these big end brasses once the parts were entirely loose, but in the end I did get them out. Now I can take a measurement of the crank pin to see how worn it is. When I looked at the top of the big end brass I noticed there was a hole in the middle, so I assume that the connecting rod must be hollow to allow oil to flow down from the crosshead area down to the big end. In this clip using an airline I'm blasting away any debris in the hole. And apart from this central oil hole that gets its oil through the connecting rod there are two more holes, one at each side, as general oiling points. I thought that the easiest way to find the diameter of the crank pin was to use a digital caliper and here I'm comparing the size of the hole in the big end brass. The diameter of the crank pin is exactly the same diameter as the crank shaft. And this clip shows how loose the big end is on the crankshaft. Very loose, a rattle fit. I really don't think that this was made this way. My theory is that the valve timing was so advanced, particularly on one of the engines, and when both of the engines were running, one of them was putting too much pressure on the other one. And that's why the big end is only worn on the second engine, because of the valve timing setting on the first engine. That is what I think caused the problem. I may be wrong, but it looks that way to me. That is the only way that I can explain why only one of these big end bearings is worn. The other one's fine. I took this opportunity to give the engine a bit of a clean. With a very light coating of cellulose thinners, I'm removing the oil from the expansion link and the valve gear. I used a toothbrush for this job and made sure I didn't get any cellulose thinners on the painted parts, otherwise the paint would disappear too. Before reassembly, I oiled everything thoroughly. What did I do to the big end brasses? I very carefully removed some metal from each of the mating surfaces. First of all, using emery cloth on a surface plate, and then some 400 grade wet and dry sandpaper on a surface plate. These parts need to be very flat. Knowing how to do this is a bit of a skill, otherwise the two bearing halves just act as a clamp. Once you get it just right, you can tell by the feel of it. Not a very engineering-like description I know, but I am not an engineer, and I work largely by feel in just about everything I do in life. Sadly, not much with girlfriends these days. Now the engine is all back together, it's time to give it a test run. I rotate the flywheel until the crankshaft is in the right position and then I open the compressed air valve.
it makes a slightly different noise going in the other direction but it's running and running well. Here's some slow motion. Here's a before and after shot, this is definitely the before, when I disconnected the drive link chain. Originally both of these engines were far too advanced, but now at least one of them is OK. In this clip I'm refitting the steam chest cover nuts, which are still 2BA, but one size smaller than normal. I just think they'll look better. One final tweak, to make sure that all of the nuts are tight, and I think that should be OK. With a bit of luck the engine should run even better and for longer because there aren't any air leaks. And that's about it for this episode. I'm just going to leave the engine running until the end of the episode. Stay safe, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.